Good evening, and thank you for coming. Um, my name is Betsy Kinsey. I'm with Environment New Hampshire, and I'll be guiding us through the event tonight. Uh, we're here to participate in the public comment period for the Environmental Protection Agency's proposed rule, the Clean Power Plan. As the largest single step the U.S. has taken to fight climate change, the importance of the proposed plan cannot be overstated. On behalf of tonight's hosts, Environment New Hampshire, the League of Conservation Voters, Moms Clean Air Force, the National Wildlife Federation, the New Hampshire Sierra Club, and the Union of Concerned Scientists, we are so glad to have you here. Obviously, there, is, or there are a few more people here than anticipated, so we're happy to see so many faces. Uh, if you can just keep coming in quietly, that would be great. Thank you. We know our time to prevent some of the worst predicted outcomes of global warming is quickly ticking away. That is why it is vital that you are all here tonight to stand up for long overdue action. So thank you in advance for sharing with all of us, with your representatives and with the EPA, why it matters to you that we act on climate. Our first speaker tonight is Cynthia Green, manager of the New England Energy and Climate Unit of the EPA. Following her presentation, we will hear from Joe Fontaine of the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services, Matt K. Helene of the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services, and Dr. Kathleen Bush of Plymouth State University. Once all four of these speakers have given us a better understanding of the plan and what it means for New Hampshire, we'll have a few minutes for two to three questions for the three of them from the audience. And after this brief Q&A, we'll begin testimony from everyone else. We have a schedule for all other speakers who have already signed up to speak tonight. If you would like to see a copy of the schedule, you can see it in the entryway. And uh, I will call you by name when it's your turn to speak. And you will come down to give your statement here at the podium. Please introduce yourself by first and last name and your town. We ask that all statements be kept to two to three minutes with an absolute maximum at five minutes. Uh, we have a warning system in place for timing. You'll see a yellow card come from the back of the room when there is one minute remaining. Great, middle of the room. And a red card uh, when your time is up. So at the yellow card, you should be wrapping up your statement. Red card means that your time is up. Uh, we only do this in order to ensure that everyone does have a chance to speak tonight, so thank you. If you're not currently signed up to speak, it's not too late. You may sign up to speak at the registration table in the entry. Also note that in the entry, entry room, you can sign a petition to support the Clean Power Plan, as well as submit a letter to the editor in support of the plan. Uh, these activities will be ongoing throughout the night, so definitely stop by. The hearing will end at 8 p.m. If anyone is unable to make a statement before that time, you can see Rob Warner, and he'll have more information at that at the end. And now we will begin the hearing. Uh, just to be clear, Cynthia Green of the EPA will not be recording comments tonight. We will have a video of all statements as well as written transcripts that we will submit to the EPA following tonight's hearing. Thank you again for being here tonight. And now, Cynthia Green. Thank you, Betsy, for that introduction and for inviting me here to talk tonight. As you said, I'm not taking um, any comments uh, that would be put into the record. We are in a formal comment period, so the comments need to go in writing. So I've just passed out a little business card that has a QR code on it. So if you have a smartphone, you can um, scan that in, and it will take you right to where you can put in comments. And it also has a website for the comments. And I'll also have that up in the um, presentation as well. Do I have a clicker to forward these? Or? Yes, a human one. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so quickly what my presentation will cover is I'm going to talk about the President's Climate Action Plan greenhouse gas emissions, um, the Clean Air Act Section 111, um, and then the proposal itself and how to submit comments. So the President came out with a climate action plan on June 25th and 2013. There were essentially three parts to that. One was, the first one was to reduce carbon emissions from existing power plants, and that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. But there are two other important sections. One is how to prepare us all for the impacts from climate, and the third is to how to lead internationally on climate change. 
So first on greenhouse gas emissions, this is a chart of where greenhouse gas emissions come from. As you can see, the majority of the greenhouse gases come from electric generating units, 32%. So this proposed rule is to um, work on those emissions. So Clean Air Act Section 111. Um, Clean Air Act Section 111 is really for new sources. So first what the agency does is it, pr it proposes rules for the new sources. They're typically more stringent than for existing sources. So the proposal for the new sources came out in January of this year and then for modified and reconstruction power plants it came out at the same time as for the existing power plants. Those guidelines for existing power plants came out June 2nd of this year. We have to finalize those guidelines by June of next year, and then the first submittals start to come in from the states in one more year, June of 2016. So what is this proposed plan? It has four building blocks. We worked off of 2012 emissions of greenhouse gases and looked at what the states had already. So the first building block is looking at fossil fuel fire plants and how could we make those more efficient, so improving the heat rate of the um, power plants. The second is how do we use more lower emitting power sources, and that looks mostly at natural gas combined cycle plants and looking at how do we increase the use of those plants, and the plan looks at increasing capacity of those plants up to 70%. The third building block is how do we use more zero and low emitting sources, so renewable power and nuclear power. And the fourth is how do we use electricity more efficiency, so efficiently, how do we reduce the demand for power. So um, specifically, here are what the um, goals are for the six New England states. Looking at the first 2012 fossil emission rate, that's what the current emission rates were in 2012. Adding in then the renewables, which is um, the third building block, and the nuclear, I'm sorry, the second building block, and then what are the actual goals? I can, I'm sorry that the background is a little dark, so it's hard to see it. But there's, there are two goals here. One has to be met by 2029. So um, that goal is met over a 10-year averaging period. And then the final goal is by 2030. And you have to meet that goal over a three-year period, um, three-year averaging uh, from 2030 and thereafter. So we had a lot of public meetings before we um, proposed this rule and took in lots of comments. And what we heard mainly was people wanted flexibility on how to meet this rule. So we gave them flexibility in time, essentially 15-year window in order to come up with a plan as to, not come up with a plan, but how to co um, comply with the plan. And they have up to two to three years to submit plans from the states. Um, and the states can use a rate base. So those numbers I showed you were in pounds per megawatt hours. That's the rate base, but they can convert that into a mass base. We'll accept that as well. You can come in with a plan for one state or multiple states. If you have to do it for multiple states, you get more time to do that. The states can use any one of those four building blocks to figure out how they're going to meet that goal um, in 2029 and 2030. They can also come up with additional ways to meet the goal. We're very flexible on how we meet that. So now I want to talk about the costs and the benefits of the plan. We looked at how much was it going to cost to meet um, these goals. And it's between 7.3 and 8.8 .8 billion dollars by 2030. But then we looked at what are the benefits um, of these plans. And there are two different distinct benefits. One is in the pollution side. Um, CO2 reductions we estimate will be at 30% lower than the emissions at, in 2005. When you reduce the CO2 emissions in a power plant, you have co-benefits of um, particulate matter as well as nitrogen dioxides that also get reduced and we're estimated those reductions will be about 25 percent. On the health side, we estimated between 2,700 and 6,600 premature deaths would be avoided and will avoid 140 to 150,000 asthma attacks. 
So when we looked at the costs versus the benefits, the benefits far outweigh the costs in that the benefits are estimated at about 55 to $93 billion in 2030. The plan also ensures that we'll have an ongoing supply of reliable and affordable power um, that's needed for economic growth. And I want to take a little bit of a step away from what the Clean Power Plan is and talk a little bit about what has happened in New England already. So this graph looks at what sort of emission reductions we have already garnered from the state um, rules that are already in place. And Joe's going to talk about Reggie and what that has accomplished. Um, and we also looked at what was the growth on the state gross domestic product over that time. And as you can see in that top line, we had a 22% growth in um, state domestic product. At the same time, that we had a CO2 reduction of 20% and a 71% reduction of NOx and 93% of SO2. And we expect that with the clean power plan that goes into effect, we will see the same sort of thing. Um, gross domestic product will continue to increase and we'll see reduction of pollution. So what are the next steps? There's a 120-day comment period. It ends October 16th. Um, this is the website to um, submit any comments. We are holding four public hearings where we are taking comment in Denver, Atlanta, Pittsburgh, and Washington, D.C. I can tell you those are two-day public hearings. They're fully subscribed. We're expecting um, a lot of comments to come out of those. I think it's 1,600. We have already received over 300,000 comments on this rule. So a little bit more detail on where you can put the, the, uh, your comments. There are several different ways of doing it. Um, I suggest you use the card that I gave you and go to that, that uh, website and it will tell you very clearly how to do it. But you can do it by fax, you can do it by mail, and you can hand deliver it. So, um, and this is just what you have on your card. Uh, as to how to submit comments. So I encourage you, if you have comments or opinion, please do feel free to um, give us your comments. We want to hear them. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Joe Fontaine, uh, as Betsy said, and I'm the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative program manager for the Department of uh, Environmental Services here in New Hampshire. I want to thank the program organizers uh, for this opportunity to speak on behalf of DES regarding the Environmental Protection Agency's uh, proposed guidelines to address carbon dioxide emissions from existing fossil fuel fired electric generating units. At the outset, DES wants to thank EPA for engaging stakeholders in an active dialogue both before and after the proposal. In fact, in December of 2013, New Hampshire, along with eight other REGI states, submitted joint comments to EPA in advance of the proposal. And those are available on the REGI website, rggi.org. New Hampshire has already demonstrated and will continue to demonstrate leadership by achieving reductions of CO2 emissions from power plants. In 2002, New Hampshire enacted first in the nation legislation that addressed CO2 emissions from power plants. In 2008, uh, New Hampshire enacted legislation that authorized the state's participation in REGI. And in 2009, along with the other REGI states, New Hampshire began implementing the program. <laughs> Given the dramatic success of New Hampshire and the other REGI states in lowering CO2 emissions from power plants while at the same time growing the regional economy, New Hampshire has a unique perspective to offer. Not only have regional CO2 emissions already been reduced by more than 40% from 2005 levels, but New Hampshire CO2 emissions have been reduced by more than 48% from nearly 9 million tons in 2005 to 4.6 million tons in 2012. New Hampshire's 2020 base budget 
under Reggie will be slightly over 4 million tons. Regionally, Reggie will achieve an additional 14% reduction in CO2 emissions from power plants from its 2014 cap of 91 million tons down to its 2020 cap of 78.2 million tons. New Hampshire's experience with Reggie demonstrates that regional cooperation can achieve the most cost-effective emission reductions, enable a transition to a lower emitting and more efficient power sector, and create benefits and jobs as supported by a recent report released by the analysis group available on their website. The Reggie program is one of the most important tools that Reggie states utilize to help reduce CO2 emissions. The Reggie states are promoting renewable energy through renewable portfolio standards and supporting investments in energy efficiency that have reduced the amount of electricity consumed and lower bills paid by electricity consumers. In this context, the Reggie program plays three integral roles in achieving emission reductions. The declining cap and corresponding change in the cost of allowances provides market, market signals that support fuel switching, on-site energy efficiency, the retirement of higher emitting plants, construction of new, more efficient plants, and other measures that reduce emissions. The auction mechanism provides a source of funding for complementary energy efficiency and renewable energy investments that further reduce emissions. The enforceable emissions cap ensures that the combined effect of the Reggie program and the suite of supporting policies actually reduce emissions to equal to or below the cap level over time. It provides a simple, transparent, verifiable compliance system. EPA's proposal, as you've heard, incorporates four building blocks to achieve emission rate reductions. Heat rate improvements at coal-fired power plants, redispatching from higher emitting coal-fired and oil-fired power plants to a lower emitting natural gas combined cycle power plants, retaining and adding renewable and nuclear energy, and achieving additional demand-side energy efficiency. REGI has already achieved and will continue to achieve sig significant CO2 emission reductions using these building blocks. DES believes that the best and most cost-effective system for CO2 emission reductions is a regional mass-based program such as REGI. DES looks forward to working with EPA as this process goes forward. DES plans to review the final guidelines once they are issued in June 2015 and to then submit an acceptable plan before June 2018. While individual state plans are expected to be due in June 2016, <coughs> EPA has proposed that states participating in multi-state compliance approaches such as REGI may request a two-year extension for plan submittal. Again, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight, and we look forward to hearing your comments and reading the comments that get submitted to EPA. Thank you. Good evening. Hi, I'm Matt Kayleen from the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services, um, the public health section. And thank you for inviting me to speak today on the proposed EPA Clean Power Plan. Um, I'm the manager of the Climate and Health Program within the Division or Department of Health and Human Services. And the program is funded um, under a cooperative agreement with the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. Let me cover a few points um, regarding health. Uh, New Hampshire DHHS is dedicated to improving public health in creative and immeasurable ways. And the proposed plan has the potential to prevent a number of health issues or problems. The effect of the EPA plan will be to reduce carbon dioxide by 30% by 2030, as you heard, and reduce other air pollutants that affect our health. Carbon dioxide is not a health threat in itself, but yet as a greenhouse gas, it's creating a warmer, wetter New uh, Northeast with more severe weather. Two air pollutants of, pollutants of most concern for us and from a public health perspective are particulate matter or PM2.5 and ozone or what you might consider smog. Um, on a national level, reducing exposure to both particulate matter and to ozone in 2030 is projected to prevent a significant number of illnesses. 
Um, uh, 2,700 or more premature deaths across the country, 140,000 or more asthma attacks in children, um, 340 or more heart attacks, uh, 2,700 hospital admissions, and uh, 470,000 missed school or work days. So you can see the significant impacts that are out there based on these two um, air pollutants. So what does that proposed rule mean for New Hampshire's health? A recent Harvard-Syracuse study indicated that EPA rule is, if it's realized, southern New Hampshire will see less particular air pollution. So that's that PM 2.5. Um, based on that assessment, there would be a reduction in asthma attacks and heart attacks in New Hampshire. The DHHS has a state health improvement plan that we call the SHIP. Um, it's already been acting to reduce illness, deaths, and disabilities from conditions like asthma, heart attacks, and lung disease. Our goal is to continue to pursue the SHIP plan and continue to assess how the EPA plan may help reduce death, uh, disease, and disability among our citizens. And I think there's four important things to remember as we move forward. First, climate change has multiple public health impacts beyond just the air quality ones we're talking about today. Efforts are needed to protect the vulnerable populations. So we're talking about children, the elderly, and people who have pre-existing illness, so the important ones to identify and protect. Um, I think the prevention act, preventive actions we take now, such as carbon mitigation and adaptation actions at the community level, can provide more health protection later on, so it's important to plan early. And lastly, carbon redu reduction efforts, such as the home efficiency steps that you take, or carpooling, bicycle, um, bicycle commuting, things like that, can have multiple benefits beyond just reducing carbon. Of course, they can improve our fitness, and they can do other what they call co-benefits for society. So having said that, I want to thank you for participating today and joining other citizens to create a cleaner environment and a healthier New Hampshire. Um, that's all I have for prepared remarks today, um, but I'm sure you'll have questions later on. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming tonight to support EPA's proposed Clean Power Plan. I'm Kathleen Bush, Assistant Research Professor at the Center for the Environment at Plymouth State University up in Plymouth, New Hampshire. I'm here tonight as an environmental health scientist and an environmental epidemiologist to highlight the importance of the Clean Power Plan for public health. As we have already heard tonight, carbon dioxide is a major greenhouse gas responsible for increasing global temperatures. This warming of the Earth is linked to changing precipitation patterns, reduced snow cover, changes in runoff, all of which have implications for human health. According to the IPCC fifth assessment report, the observed increase in global temperatures will also increase the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events, such as regional downpours and heat waves. I wrote this this morning. <laughs> According to a recent report, New Hampshire has been getting warmer and wetter over the last 100 years. This report is just coming out from UNH um, this summer. So historical data indicates that average annual maximum temperatures have increased between about a half and 2.5 degrees Fahrenheit. That annual precipitation has already increased by 5 to 20 percent. That the number and intensity of extreme precipitation events has already increased that the number of snow-covered days is decreasing, and that spring ice-out dates are occurring one to two weeks earlier. As greenhouse gases, such as carbon dioxide, continue to accumulate in the atmosphere, temperatures will continue to rise in New Hampshire and around the world. These changes in climate and climate variability are directly and indirectly related to human health. For example, these changes are associated with increased risk of heat stress, allergies, and natural disasters, Additionally, air pollution, disease vectors such as mosquitoes and ticks, food availability, water quality and quantity are likely to be impacting by, impacted by changing climatic conditions. We can look at current trends in health data to understand what the future impacts of climate change might be on human health. And the most relevant climate-related health outcomes in New Hampshire and the surrounding region are extreme weather-related injuries and deaths, heat-related illness, asthma and other respiratory illnesses, some waterborne diseases and vector-borne diseases like Lyme disease. Mental health and stress-related disorders are also important to consider. 
According to the Weather Service, over the last 30 years, the number of deaths attributable to floods, heat waves, and hurricanes has increased across the United States. And based on previous research in places like New York City, we also know that the mortality rate is directly related to the temperature, especially that above 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So in New Hampshire, the projected increase in temperature and days above 95 could increase the risk of heat stress and death. Others have observed an increase in the number of asthma-related emergency room visits. And across New England, the number of Lyme disease cases is on the rise. Some research has shown that things like edge habitat in areas of distress can be an important predictor of tick abundance as well as the incidence of Lyme disease. Of course, the increasing number of reported cases is partially the result of better detection and diagnosis. But it is clear that a changing climate and changing land use patterns will impact vector-borne diseases. We must also consider how changes in precipitation patterns increase the likelihood of extreme events that threaten our infrastructure as well as our water quality. Previous research suggests that a majority of waterborne disease outbreaks in the US were preceded by extreme events. Some of my own research has pointed to an increased risk of beach closures due to microbial com contamination following extreme events. Communities are encouraged to incorporate climate change adaptation into their planning efforts so that our communities are more resilient in the face of global climate changes. And responding to these changes at both the federal and the local level will provide many opportunities to protect and improve human health. Many of the targets outlined in EPA's Clean Power Plan will have co-benefits for human health that reach far beyond the improved air quality. Thank you for your support. So we were going to take a few minutes at this time for a brief Q&A, but since uh, we have an especially full house and we're already a little bit behind schedule, we'll have to defer that until by some miracle there's time at the end. Um, I'm sorry to have to make this change. I know you probably all have questions, but um, definitely you can check out our materials table in the entryway and be directed to more resources there to get more information. Um, so, without the Q&A, then we're going to go ahead and have Burr Tupper speaking now. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Burr Tupper, and uh, I'm a member of Trout Unlimited, which is a cold water conservation organization. Uh, we have about 160,000 members nationwide and about 1,500 here in the state of New Hampshire. I was the former chairman of Trout Unlimited here in New Hampshire and a member of uh, the National Leadership Council for Trout Unlimited. And I'm also the chair former chairman of the Conservation Commission in the town of New Boston. Um, I'm here to urge you to help support uh, the EPA's rule to reduce uh, the amount of carbon uh, emissions from power plants. Um, I'm not sure that many of you know, but New Hampshire is geographically the sixth smallest state in the Union, and yet we have over 12,000 miles of streams and rivers and over 1,000 ponds and, and, uh, and lakes. So we have a rich heritage, which I think you know, we need to protect uh, now and for future generations. As a freshwater angler here in New Hampshire, most of us from Trout Unlimited are fly fishermen. Uh, you know, uh, that's not to be held against us, of course. Uh, uh, but I am concerned about the increasing number of storms, uh, the higher water temperatures, and the decrease in cold water habitat here in this state. Uh, and we've been experiencing this over the last uh, several years. Um, we, uh, we know that uh, scientifically there's a lot of data out there that <clears throat> points to the fact that there is climate change and that there is a major impact on our society as well as wildlife as well as the water and uh, the uh, and fish in, in general. Uh, greenhouse gases uh, are, are warming our atmosphere and our waters rapidly. We have the tools to help uh, minimize the impact on that. We can continue to support the EPA and all the great work that it's doing uh, in those areas, um, especially from the coal-fired coal uh, power plants. Um, again, we should place a lot of energy and effort in the area of looking at alternative energy sources. 
Um, specifically as it relates to, to fish and wildlife, trout and salmon are very, very sensitive to increases in water temperature. Um, we know this, uh, that water temperatures are rising here in the state of New Hampshire. They depend on clear, cold, well oxygenated water and um, it's having an impact not only on the eggs that are produced but the adults. Also, with the severe storms that we're getting, there's been a tremendous amount of scouring of our streams and rivers, especially those that were um, straightened as part of our logging heritage uh, that we had 100 years ago. Um, and this, of course, reduces the amount of mackerel invertebrate population that those animals feed on or the fish feed on, and of course, animals <coughs> in turn feed on, on the fish. So basically, uh, but also higher temperatures uh, in, induce uh, uh, more aquatic parasites and insects in, and that affect our fish population. Again, uh, we have a rich heritage that we need to protect. And then we have a, an industry that's based on, on our, our water uh, sources here in this state. And we need to make sure that those are, are protected as well and help increase the, uh, um, the amount of people that continue to come to our state to enjoy that. Uh, but again, I, I want to make sure that people understand that, uh, uh, you know, this climate change and the warming waters and so forth are having a significant impact on our aquatic population here in this state. And uh, believe it or not, uh, that is also impacting uh, the wildlife that support that is supported by that that particular environment. So that's basically all I have to thank. I want to thank the EPA for being here because it is important, and we will continue to work at uh, helping support that legislation. Thank you. Good evening, Jonathan Gregory from Revision Energy. I'm also a member of the Concord Energy and Environment Committee. Thank you for having me. Um, just gonna read a little road up, put together here. When we burn fossil fuels, meaning coal, gas, oil, propane, carbon pollution is released into the Earth's closed atmosphere. As the concentration of heat trapping gas builds up over decades, this insidious pollution accelerates climate change, triggers asthma attacks, and respiratory disease and measurably worsens air quality. Although the United States emits the highest per capita carbon pollution in the world, 40% coming from power plants, we are lulled into complacency because these harmful gases are tasteless, they're odorless, and they're colorless. It's hard for any society to combat an invisible enemy. This is something that I think we all can relate to. That's why the Environmental Protection Agency finally released the new draft carbon standards for power plants last month. The new standards immediately came under attack from the fossil fuel industry, lobbyists, and conservative politicians who want to preserve the status quo um, practice treating the atmosphere like a giant sewer. Are we doing all right on the audio here? It's my strong voice, isn't it? <laughs> Despite overwhelming scientific data proving that carbon pollution from 7 billion people is warming the atmosphere at an unsustainable rate, these deniers are saying we don't have a problem. The good news in northern New England, though, is that we have been wrestling with this massive problem for more than a decade, with modest but noteworthy results achieved thus far. New Hampshire, as stated previously tonight, is part of the Greenhouse Gas Initiative, a nine-state market-based program known as REGI. Collectively, the REGI states have avoided the release of approximately 800 million or 8 million short tons of carbon and invested in enough solar projects to replace 8.5 megawatts, uh, megawatt hours of electricity since the program's inception. Even so, the Grand State has the second largest per capita greenhouse gas emissions in New England due to our over-reliance of fossil fuels for transportation, heat, and power. The new EPA power, uh, the new EPA carbon pollution standards will help, help solve major problems like the Merrimack Station coal-fired power plant, which 
keep in mind, is the worst polluting power plant in all of New England. The good news again, though, is that New Hampshire has, um, has an abundance of renewable resources, um, which come in the form of wind, biomass, and solar energy. In fact, New Hampshire gets 33% uh, more sunshine per year than Germany, uh, which is the world leader in solar adoption since they instituted their national renewable energy policy back in the late 1990s. Today, Germany gets more than 23% of its total energy supplies from renewable energies, and their goal is 100% uh, by 2050. It's worth noting again here that Germany has one of the strongest economies on the planet, despite their lack of in indigenous fossil fuel resources. They are showing the world how to make the successful transition from fossil fuels to renewables. These are models that we should keep in mind as we make progress here in New England. During Revision Energy's 10 years in business, we have installed more than 4,000 solar hot water and solar electric systems throughout Massachusetts, Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. Our main operations have slowed because of, our, uh, because of the main solar incentives, uh, which have been eliminated uh, by the current state administration. Meanwhile, our New Hampshire operations are growing rapidly uh, because um, we've done a better job at predicting the state solar incentive program. As an example, uh, here in New Hampshire, the average home solar project involves 20 solar electric panels installed on a roof for a gross cost of $16,500, which you then can factor in 30% federal tax credit, which would be $4,950. Um, and then also a, a cash rebate from the state of $3,750 for a net investment of $7,800. This project delivers with cash purchase an average of 12% annual return on investment to the homeowner and significantly increases the resale value of the home, which uh, has been publicized by Forbes and Wall Street magazines as a statistical fact. It's important to note that solar electric systems will cl generate clean renewable energy at roughly half the cost of what a homeowner would pay the utilities otherwise. Um, other examples in, in Maine, uh, where they don't have a state rebate, they still do get the federal tax credit, but they get uh, still an 8% return on investment. So to wrap it up here, um, there are many benefits to be realized from federal carbon standard for power plants beyond the growth of businesses like Revision Energy. The public health and environmental benefits of solar energy are scientific, scientifically proven. Plus, solar energy creates local jobs in our community because we are building the projects right here in New Hampshire. Um, just to wrap it up, we are in full support of uh, the EPA uh, creating a carbon standard here in New Hampshire and look forward to participating in those discussions. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Bob Kay. I live in Belmont, New Hampshire. I'm here speaking for myself. But uh, the actual reason I'm here and the reason I was invited is because I am representing tonight uh, the New Hampshire Council of Churches, where I serve as vice president of the board of directors uh, and chair of the public policy committee. Council of Churches has been around for a very long time, many decades. It's made up of 10 member denominations, uh, Roman Catholic, Greek Orthodox, and uh, eight of the so-called mainline Protestant denominations. Uh, very often you hear about the differences among uh, Christian denominations, but we come together around uh, what we share in common. And frankly, there's more of that than the other. And perhaps it's really the important area also. One of those is something we call um, justice, peace, and the integrity of creation. And it's that last part, the integrity of creation, um, that brings me here tonight. Before I go any further, I'd like to thank all of the people and organizations that have come together around this initiative. We realize how important it is, and we also realize how nothing's going to happen unless there is a concerted effort of uh, many people. Uh, it's an enormous task. The, uh, it seems that the resistance against it is rather uh, severe, and so we have quite a job to do. 
So working with our member denominations and all of the many churches throughout uh, New Hampshire that are, uh, represent our denominations, uh, several years ago, uh, we put together something called the Faith and Environment Network of the New Hampshire Council of Churches. And the purpose was to bring this message uh, to our uh, various congregations throughout the state so that on an individual and a small group basis, people could actually take action. And uh, we will certainly uh, get behind the effort that we are talking about tonight in this regard. Uh, to just bring you um, into the fold a little bit in terms of what our actual goals are uh, within the Faith and Environment Network, let me just read them to you. Uh, there is a more lengthy policy. It's kind of theological in nature. I'm not going to go into that tonight. But here are the practical outcome goals uh, that, that we are seeking. Number one, to educate people of faith in congregations and religious bodies on maintaining the quality of life on earth through making better choices that are less polluting to the Earth's air, water, and land. Number two, to encourage awareness of how our spending choices affect the integrity of God's creation. Number three, to take action, to encourage congregations and other religious organizations to use less energy, and when available to purchase their electricity from renewable resources such as wind, solar, natural gas. And finally, to organize and encourage nonpartisan community involvement, including letters and visits to elected officials and others in positions of leadership at the federal and state uh, and uh, local levels. So that kind of sums it up. I just want to uh, provide uh, assurance that the Council of Churches will be behind this effort every step of the way. And if you want to see actually what's happening, you can visit our website, uh, nhchurches.org. Thank you. I'd like to make my own statement now. Um, as mentioned before, my name is Betsy Kinsey. I'm a field organizer for Environment New Hampshire, and I'm a current student of economics at Wellesley College. When I was in fourth grade, I was diagnosed with asthma. Asthma, in combination with my seasonal allergies, for which it always seemed to be allergy season, posed several obstacles for me. When basketball games reached their peak intensity, my lungs stopped short, and I would have to be taken out of the game. As a very competitive child, this infuriated me to no end. Thankfully, I didn't have to use my nebulizer often, but I still dreaded having to sit there and breathe through the tube. I was also more susceptible to sinus infections. I would miss school for two to three of them a year. Sometimes the sinus infections turned into bronchitis. Sometimes bronchitis turned into pneumonia. I saw the doctors and got the treatment I needed so that eventually my allergies and my asthma were under control. After only a few years, I even grew out of the asthma. For the most part, I came to believe the worst was behind me. That is, until very recently. Lately, I've been dealing with the typical allergy symptom symptoms constantly, as though I am always trans transitioning into or out of a co another cold. And then the wheezing. This summer, riding my bike to and from work, I have found my chest feeling constrained again a sensation I hadn't felt this strongly since the elementary school basketball games. I try to take an air, but it seems as though my lungs are only capable of contracting. The heat and humidity make the air thick and test my strength as I try to pedal through it. I now fear dealing with a serious medical condition that I am not familiar with treating since I was so young when I dealt with it last. Climate change means we can expect warmer springs and summers. This causes there to be more pollen in our air, making allergies worse. They're also in the air for longer. And the pollution from our power plants, in combination with the added heat, means we also have more poor air quality days. I never used to pay any attention to daily air quality, but I'm now learning to take public transit on the hazier days so as to avoid riding my bike. Climate and weather conditions can be very dangerous for people with respiratory illnesses. I am privileged to have a mild case and to have the resources I need to deal with it. These difficulties I am, I am experiencing do not seriously threaten my life. 
They do not impede my freedom to pursue personal or professional goals in a substantial way, nor do they threaten the quality of my education or the financial stability of my family. But this is not the case for many people. This is one of the many examples that illustrates why climate change is an issue of equality. People of low income, which in the US means a disproportionate amount of people of color and women, have fewer resources to prepare for and adapt to the consequences of climate change. We know that allergies and asthma are becoming larger threats to public health as the carbon content of our atmosphere climbs. And unfortunately, the burden will be felt the most by people who already have the least political representation. Limited political representation means limited advocacy for the policies and programs that are needed the most. For this reason, we cannot allow the political opportunity presented by the Clean Power Plan to pass us by. We know we need to act on climate change and we know this means cutting our carbon emissions. The health and stability of our communities demands it. So I call on our representatives to not only defend the plan on Capitol Hill, but to be strong vocal supporters of it. It is time that Senator Ayotte join our other representatives and be a champion for us by publicly supporting the Clean Power Plan. I also call on the EPA to incorporate requirements. <laughs> I also call on the EPA to incorporate requirements of community involvement in the decision making process for the state's implementation of the plan. This is to ensure that factors such as population size and local impacts in communities suffering from air pollution are central to the decision of where and how emissions reductions will take place. The rule must seek to maximize the co-benefits of co-pollutant reductions. It is absolutely essential that the plan work for the communities most threatened by climate change, not against them. The Clean Power Plan will not tackle climate change altogether. However, it is the crucial step to get us in the right direction towards a just and stable future. Thank you. My name is Eric Orff. I'm a wildlife biologist. I've been a wildlife biologist here in New Hampshire for 40 years now, or very close. I worked for the New Hampshire Fish and Game Department for 31 years, and for the last seven years, starting out as a three-month gig in uh, 2007, I've been working as a consultant to the National Wildlife Federation. I've been definitely enjoying it. I'm here tonight to uh, support the EPA's effort to cut carbon, and tonight I'm speaking for the moose. New Hampshire moose numbers are down some 40% in the last decade, dropping from about 7,500 animals to 4,000 to 4,500 today. It's such an uh, iconic species here in the Granite State and contributes significantly to our, to our economy. Moose fueling is a $12 million industry in New Hampshire. We have multiple businesses that, uh, that do moose viewing and people from far and wide come to New Hampshire <coughs> to view our moose. Not only is it important for moose viewing, but our hunters de really depend on moose. Just seven years ago, the Fishing Game Department issued 675 permits to take moose in New Hampshire. Because of the dwindling moose numbers, this fall, only 124 permits will be issued. That's an 80% reduction in moose hunting permits. A terrible economic hit to the north and to the many moose guides that uh, were utilize, or people that were utilizing, utilizing the service of guides. There are really three significant factors that contribute to the moose number decline. First is our shorter winters. Basically, when we have no snow in April, when the winter ticks or moose tick fall off, if the females fall off on bare ground, they give birth to many, many uh, juvenile ticks. They only live on the, the moose over the winter time. That fall, if we have no snow in November, these ticks quest or look for moose to get on. And they can be, by actual count, over 100,000 moose uh, ticks on some of our moose. So this last winter, the Fish and Game Department began a moose study to look at mortality. They radio called 40-something moose in January, and uh, 22 of those were moose calves. 
uh, that they called in mid-January, by the end of April, 14 or 64 percent of those moose calves had died from the overload of ticks. The second factor is our hot summers. When we have days above 79 degrees, moose fail to, to feed, they stop feeding. And what we're happening the last two springs is in June we have these 80 degree days just when female moose are giving birth to the young and they're not properly feeding and we're finding that our adult moose our uh, cows are underweight, not providing uh, the number of calves they did a decade ago. Typically, uh, a female older than age two uh, often produces two calves, and they're not doing that anymore because our moose are stressed by even our summer temperatures are underweight. And thirdly, across the southern part of the state, what we're seeing is an increase in brain worm in moose. Uh, they, uh, our, our deer whitetails typically have brain worm, but it doesn't affect them. Uh, but when a moose can get just one or two uh, uh, brain, worm, uh, uh, brain worms and it is fatal to them, and uh, I've had to deal in my career with uh, a number of moose that had brain worm. It's a sad sight to see. So across the southern part of New Hampshire, it's not the winter ticks that's the problem. It's our lack of winter and, our, and a thriving, burgeoning deer population that is probably impacting our, our moose most severely. So for the three factors, all, all factors really boil down to we're boiling. We're just too hot. We need to we need to cut the temperature. We need to cut carbon. And we look forward to the EPA to get the job done. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ken Grossman. I happen to be a member of the New Hampshire House, uh, but I'm not here to speak in that role tonight. I'm really here to speak as a parent uh, of three wonderful young adult children, and potentially, I suspect, in the next five years as a grandparent. And it's these folks that I'm worried about. Um, I, I think, this may be news, probably not in this room, that scientists, our scientists, are really smart. They really know stuff. And so I'm not going to add any more scientific information to what we have heard and we're going to hear tonight. But not only are our scientists smart, our poets can be even smarter. And there's a line from a T.S. Eliot poem, you probably know it, this is how the world ends, not with a bang, but with a whimper. And the bang, scientists warned us, the Union of Concerned Scientists, who were part of the group that's involved in this tonight, had us worried about the world ending with nuclear war a while back. And when that was going on, it worried me, the thought of having children and bringing children and having them live through that sort of thing in the world had me really worried. Well, we, we these days, I don't know whether we should, but we worry a little less about it th that these days. But the new worry, the whimper worry, is the worry of climate change and of not doing anything about it and bit by bit by bit the world that we love goes away from us. And my children and my grandchildren, yet born and unnamed, either have to suffer for that or they become among the lucky ones who do OK and watch others do poorly. And not just people, but moose and wildlife and trees and you know the whole world as we know it. So you know, again, I'm not going to add information. And I suspect that the folks before me and the folk who come after me will be preaching to the choir to some extent. And people say that in kind of a disparaging way. And I'm not saying that in a disparaging way. I'm saying sometimes the choir needs to be told to sing louder and to sing in more harmony. And so you go, EPA, and choir sing louder and with more harmony. Uh, my name is Will Abbott. I work for the Society for the Protection of New Hampshire Forests. I'm going to try and be real brief because we intend to make more comprehensive comments to the EPA. But I, um, I wanted to remind everybody that um, 
five years ago now, the state of New Hampshire published something called the New Hampshire Climate Action Plan. I happen to be privileged to serve on that group, and, and uh, I think there were something like 67 or so recommendations that were made that really ran the gamut, not just of, of uh, electricity generation, which is a significant chunk of, of our emissions, but transportation emissions, emissions from buildings that aren't properly or fully uh, insulated and, and uh, conserving uh, in design. And one of the concerns that I wanted to share with you tonight, and I think we will share in our comments, is the, the plan that's before us that brings us together is really important, but it's only one milestone and a much longer road. And we cannot forget that you know, in the, in the Climate Action Plan that New Hampshire published five years ago, we said that we were going to reduce our emissions in this state 80 percent over their 1990, level, uh, 1990 uh, levels by the year 2050. Reggie is important. It got us part of the way. And the data that Joe shared with, with us earlier tonight about the magnitude of the progress is good news. <coughs> This, P, this plan that EPA is proposing is, is, is very important. It gets us part of the way. But it's, it's a much larger uh, or longer road that we have to ride. And I just say this because um, I think it's really important that we get this done. And I think it's great that the president and the administration are doing this. But we, we cannot sit back and say, that's enough. And that's what I'd like to leave you with tonight. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kathy Goldwater. I live in Hollis. Uh, I'm the, a member of the 350 New Hampshire uh, Leadership Committee and also of the Sierra Club. Um, 350 New Hampshire uh, has, is a group of volunteers that are dedicated to uh, combating climate change and uh, reducing and eliminating all use of fossil fuels. B big goal. <laughs> but the, the plan proposed by the EPA is a vital first step toward addressing carbon pollution. By setting a higher standard for coal plants, the EPA seeks to protect children from he health risks such as asthma. We heard a moving testimony of, of a personal experience with asthma. The proposed regulations also have the potential to reduce the amount of carbon that U.S. energy production is spewing into the atmosphere reducing and then eliminating our use of all fossil fuels must be our ultimate goal as a nation and as a, as a planet. The longer we postpone our transition from fossil fuels to energy sources that don't use green, that don't emit greenhouse gases, the greater the economic costs, the human suffering, and the social injustice that will result from the climate crisis. I welcome the EPA proposal because it acknowledges that climate change is real and needs action now. I call on the government to take further steps to end our dependence on all fossil fuels. Thank you. Greg Giovanni. Greg Giovanni. Okay, then John Green. Good evening, I'm uh, John Green, and uh, in addition to being here as a Concord resident and a supporter of the new, new clean, uh, clean Power Plan, I am here representing uh, Congresswoman Custer's office. Um, so I'd like to read uh, some remarks from the Congresswoman. Dear friends, thank you for the opportunity to be part of today's hearing uh, examining the Environmental Protection Agency's new Clean Power Plan, the first ever of its kind. Conservation is in my blood. Throughout my life, I've been lucky enough to enjoy New Hampshire's unique natural beauty and I have carried this environmental ethos with me throughout my time in Congress. I've, been, uh, I've made combating climate change an important part of my work, whether it be through sponsoring energy efficient legislation in the House, advocating for the EPA to recognize the value of New Hampshire's own Reggie Carbon Trading Program, 
or through holding forums on how climate change is threatening our way of life. I've advocated for environmental proposals like the Clean Power Plan in order to help keep New Hampshire prosperous, safe, and healthy. The emission standards being discovered, discussed today are a massive step forward for the EPA in working to prevent negative impact of uncontrolled pollution on our state. Granite staters deserve clean air and healthy climate, and these rules will ensure that, the right, that right to us and future generations. The EPA estimates that these standards will help prevent more than 100,000 asthma attacks annually and prevent more than 6,000 deaths. I am proud of all the work that has been contributed to this plan. I wish good luck to any of the, who seek to improve New Hampshire's environment, and I stand ready to help you achieve those goals in any way I can. Furthermore, I pledge to continue my work in Congress to ensure that our environment is made safer, cleaner, and more secure so that Granite Staters so that the Granite State is environmentally friendly and economically secure. Sincerely, Anne McLean Custer, Member of Congress. Trudy Mott Smith. Good evening, my name is Trudy Mott Smith. I live in Loudoun, New Hampshire. I'm also a member of the 350 New Hampshire Leadership Committee. Um, <clears throat> I think it's wonderful that the federal government has brought forward a pollution control and CO2 emissions plan for all the states. I point out that the state plan is going to be, excuse me a minute, have a little hearing trouble. The state plan is going to be an individual plan for this state. That is the scheme that the EPA is putting forward. So while the EPA is giving us a good shove, we all need to be alert. This plan is about <clears throat> reducing the emissions of the various sorts from power generation. It doesn't compel a change in the energy mix. It's based on an energy mix of 2012 for the state. If we want to change the energy mix, we need to be active as citizens and help our policymakers do that. People smarter than me have already talked about renewals, renewables, and so I'm not going to um, talk further about that. But I point out that if you look at the graph on the last page of the NAR, NRDC summary of the plan, um, you will see that a large component of New Hampshire's energy mix is natural gas. Natural gas produces a lot of climate damaging emissions in its production. This is before it gets to the point where we burn it for energy, the topic being addressed by this plan. So people who are watching climate change and its various causes need to be helping their policymakers in the state government um, with every aspect of the state's energy plan. So thanks, EPA, for getting us started. Matt Lillibridge. Matt Lillibridge. OK, then we have Eric Orff again making statements on behalf of all of others. Five pages. <laughs> and I've hidden the placards. <laughs> Actually, I'm speaking of a couple of friends of mine who are having me in New Hampshire guides, fishing guides, and who could not make it here tonight but asked me to speak for them. The first one is uh, Tim Moore, a fishing guide down on the coast. He said, I've fished, I've ice fished for more than 30 years growing up in the seacoast of New Hampshire area. Most winter, most winter weekends were spent ice fishing for smelt on Great Bay with my father. The month leading up to the Sabbath smelt fishing season were filled with anticipation and excitement about what was coming with, with winter, what would winter bring. We wonder if there would be more or fewer shacks this year, if the smelt fishing would be good as last year. But one thing we never wondered about was if there would be safe ice on Great Bay. I'll, I'll admit that safe ice can't, can't form soon enough for me. If I had my way, the lakes would stay frozen all year. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, at least a few, he says. But I imagine that. I wonder if we'd be able to ice fish some seasons at all. I can remember seeing trucks driving on Great Bay when I was a kid and not, not, and not once uh, go through the ice. Now no one would dream of driving a vehicle on the ice of Great Bay because it doesn't freeze thick enough anymore. Every winter the ice that forms on Great Bay is thinner, making the smelt fishing season shorter. The winter of 2012 was the worst I can remember. There was, there was some safe ice, but only about two weeks. Then it was gone and never returned. But it, seemed, it, it didn't seem to matter because there were so few smelt to catch. Warmer water temperatures also contributed to the loss of valuable smelt habitat. I will address that more uh, fully later. As a young adult, I gravitated to freshwater ice fishing. At the time, I thought I was, dra was just drawn to the diversity of species that can be caught through the ice in freshwater. While that is true, I later realized that it was the dependability of safe ice that drew me to freshwater lakes and ponds each winter. However, I wondered how long it will, it will be, there will be safe freshwater ice to fish on. There are winters that now where, the, where lakes such as Winnipesaukee don't completely freeze over, and if they do, it's only for a brief period of time. I make my living in, as an ice fishing guy during the winter months and each, and each season gets shorter and less consistent. I now, I know weather isn't, I know weather isn't something we can control, but it has become more extreme and unpredictable than ever. I didn't grow up learning terms such as El Nino and La Nina or polar vortex, but now they are common terms because I, of the new and changing weather patterns. Another change I witnessed over the past decade due to warm water is the timing and duration of certain fish spawning. It is, it is the lakes f being free of ice that m and the amount of daylight and water temperature that, that triggers white perch and other species to spawn. The white perch usually spawn over a two week period, but now the water temperatures warm so fast and in some areas of the lake, they spawn in just one day. Warmer water has also affected cold water species like lake trout and landlock salmon. All fish species, uh, all fish species, warm water and cold water have pre preferred water temperatures and the rising water temperatures are forcing them out of their natural habitats because of depleted oxygen, algae blooms and other side effects. Carbon, carbon emissions are affecting our overall quality of life by, poisoning serious, by posing serious health risk, but the emissions also have negative in, impacts in, on the success and quality of life of our fish and wildlife, which in turn leads to negative economic, economic impacts. If we do not act, the problem will only continue to get worse. Carbon emissions are a major part of the problem and power plants are a contributor. I support the EPA's efforts to reduce carbon emissions through the Clean Power Plan. The second is from a, a longtime friend of mine. He, he's a fellow outdoor writer and guide by the name of Dick Penny. He lives in Greenland. He says, I am an, a licensed New Hampshire fishing guide. I've lived on the shores of New Hampshire's tidal waters, Great Bay, for over 50 years, not counting the time spent at my mother's camp on the bay where I learned to swim at an age of four. I support the EPA's efforts to curb carbon emissions from power plants under the Clean Power Plan. In all those years, we've seen tremendous changes on the bay and surrounding areas, and not many of them were positive. As a kid, we remember the ice in on Great Bay was always before New Year's Day, an, an event that allowed hundreds of ice fishermen, some commercial and mostly recreational, were out on the ice on that holiday. Their quarry was the incredible schools of saltwater smelt that flooded, that flooded the ice over bay to feed and eventually in the spring to run up the Great Bay's uh, freshwater tributaries to spawn. In the 1960s decade, as a New Hampshire Natural Resource Enforcement Officer, or Conservation Officer, it was my duty to patrol this ice-bound community of, over, of often as many as 500 portable ice fishing houses known, or shanties known, uh, or shanties, uh, known to locals. There were some ice anglers that came as far as 100 miles to fish here, and many of the thousands of them supported their incomes by the sale of their hook and line, some up catches, that in the early days were often caught, also caught in huge nets dropped through the ice. Catches of 100 pounds or more were notable, but not rare. I have witnessed the practical disappearance of ice over Great Bay the last couple of decades as the wonders have warmed thanks to more carbon in the, in the atmosphere. In fact, in 2012, there was really no, no, in exclamation, good ice, safe ice all winter. We have lost a tremendous important winter fishery. Waterfall, too, have been impacted by the changing seasons. I find that ducks and geese are migrating to the bay later each year. We duck hunters actually had to get the fishing game department to adjust our late waterfall season to end in mid-January rather than late December, as had been the tradition to accommodate this late, 
this, to accommodate this late migration. So warming falls and winters are impacting our hunting and fishing opportunities and really impacting the economy here along New Hampshire's coast. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Yvonne Anassi. I'm the New Hampshire field manager for Moms Clean Air Force New Hampshire. Moms Clean Air Force New Hampshire and its 2,600 members in New Hampshire support swift adoption of EPA's Clean Power Plan. But moreover, we encourage our congressional delegation to take decisive action to support the plan. Clean air and mitigation of climate change will ensure a healthier future for our children and generations to come. In addition, tonight I have been asked to share Appalachian Mountain Club's statement with you. They are on their way to D.C. tonight to testify at the D.C. EPA hearing tomorrow. And let me just share a few of their thoughts from their testimony tomorrow with you. As an outdoor constituency, we are concerned about threats to consistent and playable snow in the winter for snowshoeing and cross-country skiing healthier air to breathe and, and less pollution derived, and visible degradation and severe storms that require significant trail maintenance. We believe a focus on energy and conservation should be the priority of any plan to reduce the impacts of climate change. We do not only need to burn less fossil fuel, but maintain a balanced approach to energy development that includes land protection in pristine and natural places that are set aside for our public use. This can only be done by the overall, reducing the overall demand for energy. We are encouraged by the overall emissions reduction target of 30% by 2030 from 2005 levels, which would be a very significant step toward achieving the ultimate target for the nation of 80% by 2050. I encourage you all to take a look on Appalachian Mountains Club's website where you will find some very impressive data that they've been collecting at their data station in the White Mountains that shows, without a doubt, the increase in temperatures and decrease in the snowpack in New Hampshire. Thank you very much. Well, it's great to be here with you. Thank you very much. Look, uh, I'm here for two simple reasons. Because I share your concerns, and even though I'm an economist, I'm also a very political animal, as I think most of us need to be these days. And I want to underline the, the huge political barriers we face. So I'm going to be the political animal, I guess, in this presentation. Uh, yes, I'm an economist. Don't hold it against me. But I, I remember my days as a graduate student, which takes me back 50 years. I, has, I can't lie about my age. And I was one of the uh, young Turks in those days in the New School for Social Research Economics Department. And I said, you know, we need a, a course here in ecological economics. And to this day, I don't know that they have one. But I, I designed such a course uh, about 47 years ago. And the other thing is, uh, out of my economics practice, I picked a logo on my old business card, which is the famous, the ancient and the modern eightfold knot. And you know what that means? Everything is related to everything else. And this is part of what we're talking about here, the interrelationship of people and ecology and habitats and other creatures and so on. We face a Congress which is well known now to be dysfunctional, corrupt, but more specifically to the discussion we have here, 
We need to be clear about why we have such barriers in the Congress, apart from being the, apart, apart from the partisan dysfunctionality and the corruption. We have a Congress which has proven to be unable to re reform itself. We have one that can't deal with issues of any significant substance. And at the top of the list is global warming and climate change. That's an issue which exemplifies what Congress has proven itself to be unable to handle. Issues that are broad in scope. Issues of considerable complexity. Issues that are so long run, they can't, uh, people who think beyond, you can't think beyond uh, two terms in the Congress, can't deal with time spans of, that are intergenerational, at least, that's the long run. Indeed, hundreds of years. And this is why uh, I have founded recently an organization I call a People's and Citizens Congress. And you may have picked up a, a poop sheet on that. Be that as it may, if you want solutions to global warming and climate change that promote rather than depreciate our democratic republic, the great American experiment, it helps to recall Aristotle's definition of what it means to be a citizen. A citizen is one who participates in power. And that takes us already beyond what most people consider it is to be an American citizen. But that's the definition that counts from millennia before us. It would help too, I think, uh, to change the E and the P in EPA. The E should be ecological. The P should be power. <laughs> because we're talking about dealing with issues that really come down to power, political power, in the Congress. And after all, the Congress is the only branch of the government that's really fully commissioned to represent and to work with and for we, the people, the first three words of the Constitution. So I'm hoping the next gathering like this, we can change the geometry of this room. I hate situations like this when I'm standing up like a damn professor in front of a, a class. That's not my style. Let's get together in circles next time and face each other as we grapple with these problems and find ways to resolve them. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Ann Huberman, and this is my husband, Joel Huberman. Um, and although we've been official residents of New Hampshire for only the past 15 months, uh, my grandparents lived in Peterborough and purchased some vacation property on the nearby Sunset Lake in Greenfield. Uh, so I've been spending my summers and portions of my winters in Peterborough and Greenfield since I was a baby. Uh, and Joel's been doing the same since we first met when we were both 18. <laughs> Fifteen months ago, Joel and I moved to Rivermead, uh, Rivermead, a retirement community in Peterborough, from our previous home of 38 years in Buffalo, New York. In Buffalo, Joel was a teacher and head of a laboratory doing research on the causes of cancer, and I was a reference librarian. Both of us were concerned about climate change, and both of us tried to do something about it. Joel worked with the Buffalo group of the, um, the Sierra Club to lobby state and local officials regarding the importance of promoting renewable energy, while I worked with the Buffalo chapter of the League of Women Voters to educate the public about the economic and environmental consequences of uncontrolled urban sprawl and to educate community leaders about the benefits to be gained by having their communities become climate smart. 
We're here today to voice our strong support for the general goals of the EPA's Clean Power Plan. However, we also want to point out, point to what we see as two shortcomings in the plan. First, we think the plan places too much emphasis on the use of natural gas, also called methane, and I, since I'm a chemist, a biochemist, I frequently call it methane. Um, too much emphasis on the use of natural gas as a substitute for coal. It's true that methane is much cleaner than coal when it comes to particulate pollution, but the EPA's clean power plan is concerned primarily with carbon dioxide as a pollutant because carbon dioxide is a powerful greenhouse gas. Methane, natural gas, is an even more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And several analyses have indicated that with regard to total contributions to the greenhouse effect, our use of methane as an energy source is just as detrimental to our future climate as the use of coal. And a, a previous speaker also pointed this out. A significant portion of the environmental problem associated with methane is due to methane leaks into the atmosphere as methane is harvested by hydraulic fracturing and then transported via pipelines. Rather than encouraging the building of more methane infrastructure, Anne and I would like to see the Clean Power Plan amended to provide stronger support for clean, renewable energy sources and less support for any form of fossil fuel burning. Now my uh, second concern uh, with, with the uh, clean, clean power plan as it's, as it's currently constituted is that it doesn't seem to provide sufficient policy support for the development of renewable energy. Um, for example, uh, a policy called uh, feed-in tariffs is used in more than 100 jurisdictions throughout the world and has proved, has, has been very successful in, in promoting renewable energy. For example, uh, feed-in tariffs are used in our uh, near neighbor, uh, Ontario province in Canada. They were introduced there in 2009 and now in 2014 as a result of all of the renewable energy solar and wind energy and other forms of renewable energy brought in by feed-in tariffs in Ontario province. Ontario has just in the last month, uh, no, a few months ago in April, closed its last coal power plant. Uh, feed-in tariffs are unfamiliar to us in the United States as by that name, but they are probably more familiar to us if we call them uh, power purchase agreements. Uh, feed-in tariffs are simply power purchase agreements that uh, government agencies establish with producers of renewable energy guaranteeing a fair price for whatever the uh, form of renewable energy is, uh, allowing the um, person who puts out the capital to build the renewable energy infrastructure to get a small return, say 5 or 10 percent, on, on uh, the investment over uh, a 15 to 20 year period. Um, those of you who are interested in feed-in tariffs can ask me more about it after this meeting is over. Um, so those, those are my two suggestions. Less methane, more feed-in tariffs. Thanks. I'm the last, <laughs> I think. Am I the last? No, I'm not the last. I'm sorry. Um, anyway, I feel like there's a lot of pressure because it's getting late in the evening, and we've heard a lot of really great testimony uh, from people who are grappling with this issue much more closely than I am. I'm just here as a citizen of Concord. I'm going to try to give my perspective on the Clean Power Plan. Um, 
really, I think there's just these moments where I feel very lucky to live in northern New England, especially New Hampshire. Now, forgive me, I'm going to tell you a little story about Maine. <laughs> but I was just up in Kennebec, uh, up in the Forks, Maine, um, on the Kennebec River, and it was really early. Um, the mist still hadn't burned off over the river, and um, a bald eagle just came soaring right over the riverbed uh, where I was sitting. Um, and as someone who doesn't really get to see bald eagles a lot, I still find that to be a very reverent experience. And I think it's just these moments that I wanted to share be that you know makes it important to continue protecting the environment that we all love here. Um, I also feel lucky to live here because I see a lot of really great work happening. Um, a lot of the entrepreneurs were in this room, this people busily putting solar panels up. Um, there was, you know, 40 boilers, uh, wood heat boilers installed in Berlin, New Hampshire, um, making Berlin actually, I think, the capital of a cluster of wood heat boilers, meaning like the, there's the most wood heat boilers in any, in Berlin, New Hampshire, than anywhere else, I think, in the country is the statistic. Um, it, there's a lot of good stuff happening here in our state, and I think Will pointed out that you know there is a lot of good things happening, um, and we need to recognize that. What I take from the Clean Power Plan is that this is just this really necessary signal to me as a citizen that yes, DC is listening, yes, there's things happening, um, and that um, they have our backs and that they're paying attention. So that all of our efforts happening on the ground here locally. Um, it's being, it's resonating, and then it's trickling out, and that we're actually having a larger impact. So, um, I thank the EPA for all of the hard work that they're doing on this plan. I thank all of you that are here and the organizers of the event because it's just, it's really encouraging for me to see all of the great work being done. And with that. <laughs> Um, I'm Susan Shamel. I'm, um, this is my husband, Roger. We are sort of implants to New Hampshire, although we got married here uh, 42 years ago. We've actually been in Massachusetts, and we grew up in the sticks in Ohio, so we wanted to get back to the country, so we came up here. Uh, we formed the Global Warming Education Network in 2006 after seeing an inconvenient truth, and we thought it was going to be easy to get the word out but it hasn't been easy at all. We've been working on climate issues now for eight years, and it's been very, very frustrating. On an individual level, you can only do so much, and you can run all the rallies you want, and pull her plunges into Walden Pond, and, and march, and I mean, I marched from Northampton to Boston in 2007 on a religious witness for the Earth walk, and I marched from Nashua to Concord on a re-energized New Hampshire march in 2008, and you think this is going to make a difference, but it doesn't. Um, so I'm glad that the EPA is finally taking a stance because we've got to do this. We've got to make a start. Climate change is real, it's serious, and people act like we can adapt. We cannot adapt. When we hit seven, eight degrees, I'm sorry, there's going to be no food, there's going to be no fresh water, California's drying up. Um, I'm going to bring up something that nobody's brought up, and that's the oceans. The oceans are acidifying. That means they're becoming more acid because of the carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, CO2 plus H2O, produces CO3. H2, H2CO3, um, which is carbonic acid, a weak acid, but basically they're becoming more acidic, which means that creatures like lobsters are having trouble forming their shells. And right now it's great for New Hampshire and great for Maine because they're swimming up from Massachusetts and further south. But as the warming continues and the acid continues, they're not going to be able to form their shells. Oysters are having trouble forming their shells. And if we get down to the basics, the Phytoplankton, the basis of life, has been reduced 40% the year I was born in 1950. And they form the, the very basis of the food chain for the oceans. And, and they need um, to have a stable, non-acidic ocean to form their shells. 
A billion people in the world depend on the oceans for food. Yes, we can live in New Hampshire if we don't have our food, if, I mean, if we don't have our fish, if we don't have our lobsters, but what's gonna happen when a billion people do not have their food source? And that's what we face if we continue acidifying the ocean. And the reason I'm bringing the oceans up is because there was one time I got in a fight, uh, I was holding a sign at a political, during an election, I was holding a sign for someone, and you can guess which side I was on. And I spent an hour fighting with somebody on the other side about climate change, and he had all the denier points. And finally, I said to him, what about ocean acidification? And he said, I don't know what that is. And so I explained it, and basically he was dumbfounded. He didn't know what to say to me about that. And it made me realize that the oceans, bringing up the ocean acidification is something we need to do again and again with the deniers, because this is a very serious issue. The coral reefs are dying, our oceans are changing very rapidly, and it's a huge problem for humanity. And now I'll turn the, the Microphone over to my husband. I hope we get four minutes because we're both very verbose and fired up on this issue. And we're not necessarily that well coordinated, but I'll. I'm the chemist. I wore yes. my shirt so I could uh, show you the periodic table of the elements. If, if anybody has any questions about the chemistry, I'll answer them. There was a big long editorial in the Concord Monitor a few days ago pointing to climate models being important to uh, prove climate change. That has nothing to do with proving climate change. You take carbon and oxygen and put them together, you get CO2. CO2 absorbs outgoing heat from the planet. It acts like a blanket. This has been known since over 100 years ago. So climate change is real, it's serious, and it's urgent. And Susan and I are lucky we got here tonight. We drove through a monsoon coming from Hillsborough where we could hardly see the road. I haven't seen rain like that in New Hampshire ever before. I've seen oh, it only in we, Florida. A week ago we saw it like that. And I've seen it in Malaysia. So this is not the climate we grew up with. We've been coming to New Hampshire since we were kids. As Susan mentioned, we got married here at the Cathedral of the Pines. A storm came through there and knocked a bunch of the pines down recently, so we're even, we don't want to go back and look at it again. So um, I'm here also as a businessman. I started my own consulting company doing chemical consulting. I worked for the EPA on the ozone fluorocarbon issue in the 70s when I worked for Arthur D. Little. So I understand about business and environment. This is a really serious problem. And what scares me is that the people who make money from carbon pollution spend roughly $900 million a year through 90 different organizations to help confuse us, the common people, with the hope that we'll just meekly go along with this climate denial while they continue to rake in millions and billions of dollars from the largest industry on the planet. To me, that is wrong because I have three kids and three grandkids, and to have a few hundred wealthy executives basically control this situation and buy off our politicians, it's just wrong, and I'm not going to stand for it. So remember that when you hear the denial points. And you can go to a lot of, you know, a lot of information on the web. I recommend skepticalscience.com. Um, and you can find all the denier points there. So I support what EPA is doing. I support what President Obama is doing. And I think we should all let Obama know that we support him by calling him or going to the White House webpage. If you go to the White House webpage, which is whitehouse.gov. In the upper right-hand corner, there's an area for comments. You can click on it and write a comment. I try to do this at least once a month. Or call the White House comment line at 1-202-456-1414. Uh, that'll get you through to the White House operator, which is a little quicker than the normal comment line, which is 1111 at the end, because I've made this call hundreds of times. Let Obama know that you care. Let him know that you want his EPA to do the right thing, and you don't want to be confused by all this denial baloney. Let me say one more thing. I was born in 1945. 
That's when World War II was ending. During World War II, uh, something very scientific called radar was developed. We used radar as part of the government to detect incoming planes. Radar is science. We did not turn the radar data over to our politicians or over to our citizens to decide whether to react to incoming planes, okay? <laughs> what my point is, climate change is science. 97% of the scientists say it's real, urgent, and important. And I get a little bit upset when we tend to throw it open to as if it's a debate about whether we should act or not. So please uh, go with the science, do what's right, protect our futures and our kids. Uh, we appreciate what you're doing and make it stronger if you can. Thank you. Good evening, folks. I thank you all for your interest in this discussion and this topic. My name is Douglas Whitbeck. I am a citizen of Mason, New Hampshire. I'm also a volunteer for 350 New Hampshire, and I'm really speaking as an individual. I remember being told when I was growing up that the oceans would feed the world. That has now become a myth, which you've heard some reference to. If you'll think back a few decades, there was a movie called Soylent Green. <laughs> the main problem was the oceans had warmed and disrupted the, fuel, the food supply. So I would like to commend the EPA for developing this plan. Getting rid of particulates and carbon dioxide is a good thing. But wait, there's more. What concerns me is that we seem to be rushing headlong into replacing coal and oil with natural gas. The chemistry of that has also been mentioned previously. Swapping coal, natural gas for, for uh, coal and oil and swapping methane for CO2 is not necessarily a good thing. So what do we need to do? It, it, also confuses the issue of the need to transition to clean and renewable energy sources. And we need to tell your president, your governor, your representatives, and your fellow citizens that this is not enough, that we need to go further. And to do so, we need to join and make a lot more noise than big money can make. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Doug Bogan. I live in Barrington, but I'm here representing the Seacoast Anti-Pollution League, which is based in Exeter. Uh, and as some of you here know, I've been involved in uh, climate uh, uh, action efforts, uh, specifically uh, what New Hampshire can do, and specifically uh, cleaning up our coal power plants in particular uh, for almost two decades. And I, I am certainly glad to see that we're finally getting to the point of uh, doing more, certainly at the federal level, if not the state level, uh, to rein in the pollution from these plants. Um, I also want to thank the organizers uh, of this event uh, for providing opportunities for the public to comment. You know, it's an awful long way to Pittsburgh or to Washington, D.C., uh, so it's great that we can do it here in Concord. Um, I, I uh, do think it's uh, great, again, that we are uh, taking this step on the national level um, and that uh, in spite of what Congress has not been doing about the problem, um, and I commend the EPA for putting these rules forward. Um, as you might guess from the name of our organization, we're very concerned about uh, seacoast environmental impacts. We're also very concerned about pollution. 
uh, all types of pollution, but certainly carbon pollution. Um, others have mentioned uh, impacts to the oceans and, and impacts to coastal wildlife, but I'd like to spend a, a little bit of time on uh, specific impacts to our coastal resources, our coastal infrastructure. Um, the University of New Hampshire put out a report um, several years ago now that said that if we keep going as we've been going with business as usual, we could see as much as a 17-foot storm surge on our coastal areas at high tide uh, with uh, the uh, rise in sea level and the uh, increased storm uh, impacts. That would inundate much of our coastal communities, many of our uh, uh, important infrastructure, our schools, uh, libraries, right in downtown Portsmouth, um, and uh, also other uh, important uh, um, infrastructure, our highways. Um, I'm most concerned, of course, about the Seabrook Nuclear Power Plant uh, being right on the coast. Um, the uh, owners will tell you that it's 20 feet above sea level, no problem, it'll be above the, the, the waves. But the fact is the Seabrook nuclear plant has been experiencing flooding in their basements for, for decades now, basically since they built it. And it's a major factor in the degradation of the foundations of the plant. This is technically known as uh, alkali silica reaction. It's involved with the water seeping into the walls of the plant. Uh, a less technical term is the foundations are crumbling. And this will certainly increase as the water regime changes. We could see Hampton Beach washed away completely. Uh, uh, future climate maps are showing Hampton Beach underwater. And that will have uh, very grave impacts uh, for, for all the resources there, um, in addition to the Seabrook plant. Um, so we, we do need to take action. We'd like to see stronger action, certainly. Uh, but this is a good first step, and we hope that the, the state will uh, uh, take action as well. Um, that said, I, I do need to emphasize one very important uh, concern that we have. I, I would also say we agree with what others have said about uh, um, methane and the, the impacts of uh, increased reliance of natural gas. But one other uh, issue that hasn't been mentioned yet is uh, except by the EPA spokesperson, is that this plan would also entail uh, additional subsidies for nuclear power. We do not think that it is uh, right or fair or reasonable or in any kind of sense to be trading uh, nuclear pollution for carbon pollution. The fact is we've been subsidizing nuclear power for decades. In fact, a study by the Union of Concerned Scientists, one of the organizations sponsoring this uh, uh, event tonight, uh, showed that nuclear power has never been financially viable, and there's really no reason to put more good money, our tax and, and utility uh, ratepayer money, after bad. And uh, this, this plan, as we understand it, would allow for as much of a half cent uh, additional subsidy that's out of our uh, electric bills. That may not sound like very much, but it's about as much right now as we pay in our electric bills for the, um, uh, the um, systems benefits charge that goes to low income ratepayers to help them and for uh, efficiency and other uh, uh, improvements uh, to the energy system. And combined with the uh, existing um, uh, subsidy that we give that, that was paying off the Seabrook plant to begin with, um, which is known as the stranded cost charge. You should check out your electric bill sometime. It's very interesting what's in the fine print there. Uh, but anyway, we don't think this makes sense. The, unfortunately, the Obama administration has been trying to get additional subsidies, up to $56 billion of uh, um, consumer taxpayer funded uh, um, uh, loan guarantees for the nuclear industry. They have not been successful in getting most of that through. Um, but it, this does seem to be another attempt to uh, try to stir up this so-called nuclear renaissance when it's very clear that nuclear power does not have any future in this country as far as uh, future development. And propping up these old plants is just taking away money that could be going, should be going to efficiency improvements and greater use of renewable energy. So we do think that that part of the plan should be removed. We hope that everybody will mention that in your comments. 
Nuclear power is not clean, it's not sustainable, and it's not even carbon free. Uh, studies have shown that nuclear power is two to three times more carbon intensive when you look at the lifetime uh, emissions um, than solar power, and it's six times more carbon intensive than wind power. So if we really want to reduce carbon, we get much better bang for our buck, if you will, from putting it into renewable energy like solar and wind. Uh, so we do hope that EPA will reconsider that additional subsidy. We'd like to see more funds go toward a truly sustainable system, and uh, we hope that will go forward. Thank you very much. And I am also an activist with 350 New Hampshire. I'm proud that so many of us are here tonight. Um, I'll be really brief. I, I share the concerns about others who have spoken here tonight about reliance on natural gas uh, to get us out of, um, uh, of a climate change problem. In the first place, it won't be effective because of all the leakages of methane that, um, that um, are really harmful to the climate. Um, and nowadays, natural gas is frack gas. I don't believe we can solve our climate problems by poisoning our groundwater. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rob Werner. I'm the New Hampshire State Director for the League of Conservation Voters. And I really want to thank all of you for taking the time to come out here tonight. It, we've had a terrific range of comments, uh, and uh, again, thank you very much. Um, but it is only the beginning. Uh, we do have a moral obligation to act, as so many have said. And what can we do? Uh, we can write letters to the editor. We can make sure that our elected officials hear from us loud and clear that we want them to support true action on climate change. Uh, we can go on marches because they actually do get attention over time. Uh, we need to do that. We need to do a whole range of things that are really important. It's not one thing. It's all things together. So I commend you for coming here tonight and to then take your energy and your commitment outside of this room and to join us uh, volunteer for uh, any number of organizations, including the ones that are here tonight uh, sponsoring this event. Um, it's important that the EPA get millions of comments across the country. And to that end, if you do want to formally comment, please see me because I can give you a sheet that makes it very easy for you and uh, actually has some guidelines and some suggestions for writing those comments. So thank you again very much for coming. And this is not the last thing that I'm sure that we will do together uh, in this very important work. Have a good evening.